We chant the Brahma Viharas every night before the meditation, expressing a wish for happiness for all beings. May all those who are suffering be released from their suffering. May all those who are already happy not be taken away from their happiness. Those are wishes. But as the Buddha said, if things could be made true simply by wishing, there would be nobody who would be poor or ugly or short-lived. That's where we have equanimity as the reality principle. All beings are the owners of their actions. Notice there's no may in there. It's just a statement of fact. Because after all, how are beings going to be happy? It's through their actions. But their actions are often beyond your control. You want people to be happy. When you see somebody who's creating the causes for, for suffering, you want them to stop. As for those who are creating the causes for happiness, you want them to continue. In some cases it will happen, but a lot of cases it won't. And as John Furing said, if you develop the Brahma Viharas without a sense of equanimity, they become a cause for suffering. So as protection for the mind, we have to develop equanimity. What's interesting is that statement for developing equanimity, reflecting on the principle of karma, has more than one use in the canon. There's another place where the Buddha says when you reflect on that, it gives rise to the path. It's in a sutta where he starts out by having you reflect on yourself. I am subject to aging, I am subject to illness, subject to death, separation from all that is dear and appealing to me. And I'm the owner of my actions. That reflection, he says, should give rise to a sense of heedfulness. As you realize, you've got to get your actions under control. But then he says, you realize that these things are true of everybody, everywhere in the cosmos. We're all subject to aging, illness, and death, separation, and we're all owners of our actions. So no matter where you go in the cosmos, there's going to be aging, illness, and death. And there's nobody in the cosmos who's beyond their actions. The arhans are free. But even they have to experience the results of some of their past actions that happened, or that they did before their awakening. But everybody else, no matter where you go, even the highest levels of heaven, beings are subject to these things. And that thought should give rise to a feeling of sangwega. Where are you going to go to find a true, unadulterated happiness? There's only one place. That's nirvana. It's not even a place. It's another dimension entirely, outside of space and time. You think about that and you realize, okay, that would be the only way to find true peace of mind, to find true happiness. Everything else is laced with poison and disappointment. No matter how good your intentions are when you come into this life, you're going to meet up with beings who are beyond your control. And in some cases, your own actions become beyond your control. You begin to get heedless, you begin to get complacent. And what started out with good intentions sometimes changes. So the point here is that one. Equanimity is not the goal. We're not here simply just to become equanimous about things, because there's a sense of powerlessness in equanimity. You realize there are things that you just simply cannot change as long as you're in this world dealing with other people. They may decide they want to go to war. What are you going to do? You can protest, but what if they decide they're not going to listen to the protests? Or they're going to mow the protesters down?
People do unskillful things all over the world all the time. And this is the world we're born into. And this is one of the relatively good ones. So equanimity cannot be the goal. But the fact that the reflection on equanimity also is the same as the reflection that leads to a motivation to want to practice the path shows that when the Buddha teaches his equanimity, it's not just a general indifference. When you have equanimity for all beings, it's not just you say, well, who cares? It's more to focus you. Okay, there are a lot of things you cannot change in the world, but there are some things that are within your power, and the path is something that is in within your power. That's something you can do. That, the Buddha says, is a type of action. It's a type of action that leads to the end of action. But it's a choice you make. So when you develop thoughts of equanimity, one, to overcome disappointment, grief, or just general irritation with the world, you want to think about it a little bit more. To Take it beyond that. Simply learning how to accept things as they are. You have to learn to accept the fact that there are potentials as well. There's the potential to act skillfully, so skillfully, that you can put an end to suffering. That's there too. So this motivation starts with Sangweka, but also leads to Basada confidence that there is a way out. So equanimity, on its own, the Buddha points out, cannot just leave you doing nothing, accomplishing nothing. He says if you sit here meditating and develop only equanimity without trying to get the mind firmly concentrated, without exerting right effort, nothing happens. But if you combine equanimity with discernment, you realize, okay, there are a lot of things that you can't control, but there are some things you can. Focus on those. You've got those three kinds of fabrication. You've got the breath coming in going out. You can change the breathing so that it's comfortable. It's bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication. You can direct your thoughts to the breath and evaluate the breath, make it more comfortable. And once it's comfortable, use that sense of comfort. Spread it around the body. Spread your awareness along with the breath. So you have a good, solid place to stay here. In the middle of fabrication, perceptions and feelings. Try to develop some perceptions, one, that help the mind to settle down. And then, too, think about the perceptions that help you look at things that you've been holding on to that have been causing you to suffer. And learn how to let go, not simply out of acceptance, but let go out of understanding. You're asking, why is it that you go for these things? What's their allure? Can you see through that allure? Contemplating the drawbacks, I mean, the main drawbacks are. Those three perceptions that the Buddha has you apply to these things. Is it true that these things are inconstant? You look at them, yeah, they have their inconstant side. When they're inconstant, they're stressful. If they're stressful, are they worth holding on to? And you see what little satisfaction you get out of the, the allure and how much suffering comes with the drawbacks. Something inside should say, this is not worth it. I can let go. That's letting go out of understanding, and it leads to something special. If you simply let go and you're where you were beforehand, the Buddha wouldn't have recommended it. But this special letting go opens up something uncanny inside the mind, something you didn't expect. There is that possibility, and there. There's no need for equanimity. There's nothing to irritate you, nothing to lead to grief, nothing to lead to disappointment.
total happiness. Now the result of that total happiness is that you look at the rest of the world and you no longer have to feed on it. Because you realize that's what you're holding on has been. You've been holding on to things so you can feed off of them. You need nourishment. And sometimes you get some good nourishment, sometimes you don't get good nourishment, sometimes you get really bad nourishment. But when the mind gets to a point where it doesn't have to feed anymore, then it can look at the world with a different kind of equanimity. There's a good will for all beings, but it doesn't hurt. Because you're not trying to feed off of other beings' happiness. So it's good to reflect on this principle of karma. That all beings are subject to their own karma. And notice the various ways in which it can be used to bring the mind into line. To accept what has to be accepted and to focus on changing what can be changed in a good direction. That's when your equanimity becomes wise. As the Buddha pointed out, there are skillful and unskillful forms of equanimity. So do your best to develop the kind of equanimity that really is useful. that gets you focused. That gets you on the path. <laughs>